Perfect. We'll take it off with you, Jimmy. Yeah. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Yeah? Okay. okay. So welcome to day two, everybody. Uh, my muscles are a bit more covered up than they were yesterday. <laughs> Zara gave me this t-shirt probably for that purpose. Um, so I just wanted to start off by talking about a quick story. So last year, I decided to uh, supplement my training as a psychotherapist by doing a trauma diploma. So it's specifically about working with trauma therapy. So um, having worked with ex-Muslims for about five or six years now, both in a national context in the UK, but also in an international context, maybe with clients in Saudi, Pakistan, all across the world, really. What was really clear was this experience of oppression that individuals were experiencing. I can't get any closer, but OK, I'll try. Um, well, what was really clear was the experience of oppression that individuals were experiencing. So as you've seen in the movie, there was kind of like this um, experience of oppression and persecution that might come at the hands of your family if they find out that you're an ex-Muslim or even the wider community, perhaps in somewhere like uh, the UK or another Western liberal democracy. But in Muslim-majority countries, the idea that the state is also a persecutor, that at some point, if it's found out that you are an ex-Muslim, there might be some kind of judicial process against you that might lead to uh, um, imprisonment or, at worst, execution. So it made sense to go and supplement my training uh, with a diploma in trauma therapy. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been on any psychotherapy training, but it is a beautiful and difficult place to be. For us, part of our role is to actually bear witness to that which is unbearable, to listen, perhaps for the first time, to something that is unspeakable for the client. And in that moment of them sharing with you something that they have experienced, or even something that they are thinking about, some level of transformation and healing takes place. On the first weekend of the course, it became apparent to me that there was an individual on the course who was a Muslim therapist. There was probably about 16 of us there in total. Having worked with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain for some time now, I understood how contentious this topic can be sometimes. Particularly when you're in the presence of somebody who is Muslim, uh, it can be more contentious, sometimes explosive. So as therapists, a room full of us, it is sensible to bring to the surface that which is going on underneath the surface. And I said, actually, guys, as a group, I'd like to discuss the idea that I will be coming here talking about the experience of ex-Muslims, my experience as an ex-Muslim, and my experience with this religion that essentially I see as an enabler to violence against women and an enabler to violence against gays. And for me, this is an oppressive force, as it is for many of my clients. In that room, somebody launched forward to say, well, actually, homophobia is a universal experience, and it isn't religion, particularly Islam, that is something that causes homophobia. Another person launched forward who actually works in the arena of violence against women of girls, and she said, religion isn't a reason that men beat their wives, but they might use it as an excuse. And then my Muslim colleague on the course made sure that she let me know that Islam means peace. <laughs> so whilst I said I'm not here to have a theological conversation with anybody, all I wanted to do was raise the possible contention to the surface so that we could find a way to navigate it. In the same way that a woman in this room might want to challenge misogyny, and I'd be expected to hold the space for her in what she was describing, or that any of the ethnic minorities in the room, we might want to discuss our experience of white supremacy or racism, and the expectation would be that the white therapists in the room would hold the space for us. This is all I was asking for. But if they wanted, I could recite the verse that told you, I can beat my wife if I fear she's disobedient. And if you like, I can name the countries which are exclusive Muslim majority where execution of gays was legitimate at that point in time. And Islam doesn't mean peace. It actually means submission, which I would suggest is the opposite of peace. But we weren't here to have a theological conversation, just to navigate what might be discordant. The Monday after the weekend of the course, I got a phone call from the course leader. There had been a complaint put in about me due to an allegation of Islamophobia. Over the next three weeks, I was having to pull together arguments from the course guidelines, which said 
actually as part of this course you're going to have to sit with disagreement. You may experience offence, but as therapists we need to be able to detach from that and hold space for each other. That this was an exploration of ideas and that trauma therapy is inherently uncomfortable and difficult to hold. I then had to go and pull examples from the websites of the UK government where I have a right to criticise religion, and then go to universities and elicit documentation that argued for academic freedom and why this was all perfectly <coughs> legitimate conversation at what was a master's levels uh, course. I'm pleased to say that three weeks later, the allegation and complaint was dropped. What I'm not pleased to say is that it was dropped because the Muslim colleague withdrew from the course. And actually, if we can't get two therapists who are psychotherapists to sit down in this space and experience apostasy in a way that is constructive, it really isn't a hopeful endeavor for many of us. So even in this space where actually the unspeakable should have been spoken, where we should have been able to sit with the unbearable, even there, ex-Muslims are taboo. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so my best friend Mimsy couldn't make it, and uh, I made her do a video just so she's part of this panel, especially because Jimmy and Mimsy are both psychotherapists as well. Um, video, please. Hi guys, it's Mimsy. I couldn't make it this time, unfortunately, but I did just want to add something really brief to this discussion. I'm a trauma counsellor and a transformative coach for Wayne Coaching, and I work a lot with people who leave controlling religions like Islam, you know, religions that dictate every aspect of your life. You know, Islam basically tells you what to eat, what to wear, who to be friends with, what to drink, who you're allowed to marry, your day-to-day -day activities, as well as your big goal activities. Everything is dictated there for you and how it should be done and what needs to be done, just going to the toilet. So when you come from a religion that's so strong in control, you know, the communities, the families, they also come with a lot of that control, which actually turns into abuse. There is physical abuse for sure in many families that is normalized by things that are in the religion itself as well. Um, but emotional abuse is so, so strong. It's this emotional blackmail. It's this, you know, gaslighting, um, you know, um, guilt tripping people into feeling like, actually, you're my child. You should live up to my expectations. There is this understanding that, you know, I've given you life. Therefore, I have ownership over your life, which makes no sense in the real world. But actually, in these communities is completely normalized and is a normal concept that you should do what your parents want you to do. And having your own identity, having your own ideas, having, you know, everything that you want on your own terms is not a normal concept. So actually normalizing discussions like this event and, you know, the, the kind of, and the organizations that are a part of this, that are trying to normalize dissent, because for so many people that I work with, the guilt and the shame that they carry with them is so strong that they don't realize they don't need to feel that anymore. You know, we work through all the kind of physical abuse, but then the emotional abuse as well. I'll give you an example. I work a lot with women and there is huge, you know, uh, shame in their bodies because of the misogyny in Islam. The, the way that you are made to feel as a woman, it's your responsibility, whether you're sexually abused or you're, you know, if a man gives you attention, it is your responsibility to cover your body from them. So that shame of your body, covering your body, um, is so ingrained in women that they actually feel this guilt. And that guilt can, for so many women, just, you know, carries on even when they don't believe in the religion anymore. It carries on in their sort of day-to-day -day life. So there are so many things that actually we need to normalize. Actually, this is a bad concept of this religion. We need to talk about this. This is not okay. Um, and so, you know, Islamophobia stops this concept of Islamophobia, stops a lot of these discussions from happening. And actually what we're doing here is allowing people to suffer in silence. But yes, I'll leave it there. And I'm sending you guys so much love and peace and hopefully see you soon. I'm 
sure somebody is sending her a message saying that we just watched your video. But if you're not, then please do it so she feels happier <laughs> and a part of this. Halima, I want to start with you. I think elements of what Mimsy mentioned, but also what Jimmy mentioned. Um, a lot of the Western world doesn't know what's happening with young Somali boys and girls who are taken from Western, like their citizens of the West, are taken from the West and taken back to Somalia because they're too Westernized or they're LGBT or they don't believe. Can you tell us a bit more about the fear that this young Somalis live in? I mean, fear. <laughs> I'll get to the fear, but uh, what you're talking about in Somali is actually called Dakan Elis. In, and I'm putting it in quotes because it's so widely used and it means li the literal meaning is. Can you guys hear me, by the way? Uh, the literal meaning is uh, back to culture, but it's, it's used as an excuse to actually punish ex-Muslims, gays, anyone who's like a bit more progressive, less conservative, uh, you know, like not really towing the community policing line. And um, I had the displeasure and the really traumatic experience of having gotten involved with a case like that in 2019 where uh, as an American citizen, family had uh, traveled and they were told they're going to holiday. Um, but the, the kid is, you know, I'm calling this, this, uh, this person a kid because I'm, I'm older and they're like uh, in college and, and, and their main big thing that they did against their family was that they were caught smoking weed and, uh, but I know we've been in touch with this person and they are ex-Muslim. I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but I just wanna touch a little bit on how, um, what had happened. At the pretext of holiday, taken to Nairobi, a locked up Western passport, American passport taken away, um, has no choice, cannot reach to the embassy, and the only people they can reach out to is on social media to people like us, and getting into campaigns is a very difficult mission to do, but it's literally saving somebody from abroad. Um, so it's, that's what we did, and, and that, that problem is, it causes a lot of trauma, it takes a lot of year, many, many years to recover from. I just, I just yeah. had one yeah, follow-up question. Yeah. Did you also experience that when this person had come abroad and is safe, that yeah. they were able to even file a report against their parents? Ah, actually, it was the other way around. Oh. Uh, what had happened was, um, after we, the mission is complete, basically, and we know that the person has landed in America, um, we saw a Facebook post by a police, uh, American police of, of the city this person is living. I'm really being vague because I'm not going to mention it. Um, and where the police posted that they're missing and they were last seen at an American airport with a shot, a picture of the person. And we had to contact this police and tell them that that's not the case, but it's because the family that was left in Nairobi reported to the American police and without them finding out exact details of what was going on, I don't know why police these days post things on Facebook anyway, but that's what happened. And that poses another layer of, of, of danger, even after, uh, after it's such a traumatic 24 hours that she had that it, it, was, it was when we were talking, it was so hard to like, and she's like, what do I do about the police? Also the American police want to do this. You know, it's like, no, it's, it's you know, so it, there was a lot of XMNA was involved, heavily involved at that time. XMNA uh, took care of that part because I was in Amsterdam anyway. Yeah, so. Uh, did that, does that answer yes, your question? Yes, thank you. Milad, um, when, I, when I grew up in Tanzania as a Shia, the Yahusains, um, we praised... <laughs> <laughs> we, we praised Iran a lot, right? Like, my family was a massive supporter of the Islamic Republic in Iran. And uh, it was really... <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was really surprising to me that, like, when I, when I left Tanzania and I was abroad, and the Iranians I met in Malaysia, in Australia, and even in Sweden and the UK, just hated their government, were not religious at all. Whether or not they were the atheists was a question, but they were just... They just hated Islam. And that was really surprising to me. And you know, until the 2022 protests, a lot of people did not know that 
Iranians on the ground are actually fighting against their government, and so much misinformation is still happening now, especially where the Islamic Republic is getting support. Can you tell us a bit more about how you know, the, the wave of atheism came about to be in Iran and what has happened since? <laughs> Yeah, um, I was actually kind of shocked when you uh, told me the very first time there's like Shia Muslim in Tanzania. I was like, the hell? <laughs> what the hell are they doing there? But um, the thing is, um, yeah, there, there's a big um, movement of atheism in Iran, specifically after the 1979 revolution when Islamists uh, could overcome the revolution and the official law of the country become uh, Islamic based on Shia specific version of Shia Islam in Iran and the young generation is like it's 45 years now since the revolution um, and the young generation um, really um, do not really obey the Islamic rules and what the government want them to do. There is like um, statistics um, uh, from a um, Dutch organization sponsored by some of the university in Netherlands says like there is only 32 percent of Iranians uh, like define themselves as Shia Muslims only 30 percent 32 percent and I'm talking about a country if you say something against the government you may get executed like is like a year ago something, we had two person, uh, Sadrullah Fazeli Zareh and Yusuf Mehra, they got executed and the government like publicized it uh, proudly that we killed two people only because they, uh, they criticized Muhammad. So we're talking about a country you may get jailed or you may get executed if you say I'm atheist, I'm ex-Muslims. But at the same time, the statistics shows there is like 30% of the Iran 32% of the Iranians see themselves as Shia Muslims. Uh, is more than 10% now of the people officially say we atheists. So 10% of the people they say we atheists, no matter what happened to us, even if we get in jail, according to that statistics. And if you ask me, Zara, the number is much higher than that. Specifically, if you talk about the Z generation, let me give you one example. Uh, in Iran, there is like a huge budget of the government to, um, how to say, advertise the Islamic rituals, including Ramadan. In Ramadan, there you are forbidden of, from eating and drinking uh, in public. If you go to school and if you're underage, you, can still, you cannot drink and eat uh, during Ramadan. And uh, over the past two years, specifically last year, after the Women's Life Revolution started, on the 13th day of Far our Farvardin, which is like you know ceremony that everyone goes out and celebrate the spring, uh, the Iranian uh, ate their lunch in public. No matter the police would arrest them or like you know attack them or they may get in jail, they ate them in public. And clearly said like we don't we don't give a fuck about Ramadan, <laughs> and we do whatever they want. That was very astonishing. So that that shows, like you know, there is a big movement of atheism and do not liking the Islamic regime and Islamic as a rituals in Iran. According to that statistics, more than 80 percent of the Iranians, more than 80 percent, almost 80, 70, 87 percent of the people believe in secularism for today. So, I think. Uh, we're not talking about something hidden right now. I was just watching that movie, and one of the person I could just understand from the accent that he's Iranian, and he said, like, only because we're silent, it doesn't mean we exist. We're not silent anymore, at least for the Iranians. We're not silent anymore. We are, just look what happened during the Roman life revolution. Women, girls were burning their hijabs. Uh, turban was following down, dropping, like the kids were dropping down the turbans of the mullahs. Uh, the ceremonies, the funeral ceremonies, uh, were no sign of uh, like no uh, Islamic rituals. There was no reading Quran or like no wearing black or like no, the, the way that she and Muslim go for the funeral. Uh, the people were playing music, women didn't, did not have hijab, they were dancing for the ceremonies. Uh, there was a dad who lost his uh, son, he was dancing for his son's birthday as a funeral. So that's, that shows there's like a, I mean, the Iranian want change. The Iranian do not really like uh, Islam as a government. And atheism is a trend right now. Just one last sentence at this part. Uh, if you really want to look cool, progressive, someone um, who think about, someone who has a personality, you have to be atheist 
in Iran. Otherwise, you count it as one of those clerics work side by side with the government, so you will be boycotted by the majority of the people, and that's a great achievement by the Iranian people. You know, I always thought it would be the people in the West who would be leading revolution for women in the Middle East. But when the Iranian revolution happened in 2022, I'm getting to it. So when the Iranian revolution happened in 2022, after, you know, so many times that we've been all silenced, you know, I knew that the change had to come from women in the country, as well as all of us outside. But it wasn't the Western feminists doing it for us. It had to be Iranian women leading the marches. They never have, Sarah. They never have. No, it was, it was so sad. Like, uh, the suffrage movement just applied to white women. It didn't apply to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Jamal, um, you came from an Islamist background and you were raised in Turkey. You're an active partic participant of the Islamist movement. Yes. And then you've now come to start the ex-Muslims of Norway. Can you tell us a bit more about that transformation going from like an extreme side to coming, you know, being an atheist as well and starting something that supports our uh, atheists? First of all, I'm happy that happened. Uh, <laughs> And let me use uh, my uh, three minutes effectively, so I have written a little bit too because of my English. But uh, first of all, um, uh, after going into uh, Islamic uh, theology uh, and realizing that Islam is a lie, actually a uh, uh, dangerous lie, I, I stopped being a practicing Muslim in Turkey already before I come to Norway. Uh, and uh, uh, and. I realized that uh, the uh, the true interpretation of Islam is actually this what everybody calling a so-called extreme interpretation of Islam, according to Muhammad's story. So when I realized that, uh, I was no more Muslim in Turkey. Uh, uh, but without saying anything uh, to anyone uh, that I, I, I didn't announce my apostasy in Turkey because no need that, because it is dangerous. In any Muslim co majority country, it is dangerous to be an apostate. Even in the most secular, so-called most secular country like Turkey. You never know. There is a lot of killings it happened in Turkey too. And people are arrested because of blasphemy uh, every day, today even. Uh, so, uh, uh, I'm, I'm calling, because I live in a Turkey, a country where majority of Muslims are hypocritical Muslims. Uh, those, I call them like the only Friday uh, prayer Muslims or uh, Muslim or only in the name. Uh, so it was easy to be an apostate in Turkey in, in the closet, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but what happened, uh, you know, uh, living Islam created a sense of uh, betrayal inside me when I left it. Uh, that uh, like the feeling of being betrayed in, on, in all my life by a lie. Where I, wherever I look, my mother, my family, my friends, neighborhood, every, everyone, when I look at them, I just see them like they are, they, are, they are being betrayed by a lie and they are living by a lie. They are wasting their life with it. Um, uh, and also, the other thing happened to me, uh, the most important thing, this, uh, like, um, uh, the hate, the unreasonable, uh, unreasonable hate against Jewish and non-Muslims dis disappeared from me. I became a human being. I became a humanist, you know, from an Islamist. And uh, I looked at people just like fellow human being. Uh, but the second phase of uh, my uh, journey out of Islam started uh, after I came to the free country, namely Norway. I don't know how much free, but free country, of course. Um, uh, and there, um, I realized that uh, became a public ex-Muslim, announcing uh, at, that I left Islam and I started an organization and uh, doing blasphemy every day criticizing Islam and giving information uh, and collaborating with a lot of beautiful ex-Muslims around the world, it became more difficult. You know, you have to be very be, care be careful. 
because the intolerant and uh, dangerous uh, Islamists are here too. Nowhere is safe. You have to have like uh, security. Many, many ex-Muslims have uh, police security. Uh, so many of them have like alarm I have. <laughs> Actually yesterday night, you know, I just want to check my alarm if, if it was um, uh, full battery on it. In the night, one o'clock, uh, on, on the bed, and I just clicked this two seconds more, you know? Like, I didn't know, and suddenly it's just police calling me. And I have to explain, really, this was an accident. I just want to check, because I will have it with me to Oslo. And this is really so sad, and uh, that I'm sure many people who come here today, or yesterday, I don't think that uh, they they had like hundred uh, percent thinking and feeling like everything's okay. I just go to one theater or, or just a conference. No, everybody think why because of the fear, you know, Islamic fear. Um, so uh, while many of us lose our families and friends, like me and many of you guys here, uh, and risk our lives uh, to normalize acceptance of uh, apostasy and blasphemy in Islam. Uh, at the same time, many of us experience, like organization which I have, exclusions, discrediting, uh, and uh, even invisibility in the West by many Westerners, uh, where the Islamo leftists are doing their best to restrict free, uh, freedom of speech uh, while giving even greater space and uh, power to a religion that only exists today. Uh, because of the, its death penalty for apostasy and blasphemy. And lastly, I want to say, unfortunately, this is the reason why many ex-Muslim activists uh, here in the West burn out, uh, go into depression uh, due to anxiety, and simply uh, give up the fight. This is incredibly sad to witness in 21 centuries Western countries, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Jamal. I just want to go to you, Momo. Momo, you, you, you grew up in France, where the implementation of secularism, or let me correct myself, laïcité. <laughs> I, have, I have it in my notes. <laughs> um, the strict separation of state and religion um, is implemented. But the reality for you was a bit different, growing up in the suburbs that you did. So a lot of us don't know you. Can you give us a bit more background into you know you before I open up the floor sure. back to Jimmy and everybody else to talk about the panel again? Thank you. So as you mentioned, I started my activism with a podcast. Mm. And in this podcast, I invite an uh, ex-Muslim. So we talk about the reason why they left Islam. And the podcast was uh, the very beginning of a long journey that leads me to organize the last uh, Celebrating Descent uh, in Paris with uh, Nadia, Maria, Betty. It was like? Like de tous les pays unissez-vous. Oh, uh, like of the world unite. <laughs> and um, yeah, and uh, actually, like currently, I'm the president of uh, an association in France. So we, it's an association uh, uh, of apostates, and we try to emancipate uh, them from their religious, uh, you know, the religious uh, neighborhood that they have, like, uh, yeah, things like that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the reason why I find the, the energy to do all those things, it's uh, because of my past. So actually, as you said, uh, in France, we grew up in a laicity environment. But you know, I was, uh, I was living in an Islam uh, household. So um, laicity was not really an issue for me. It was more Islam. So, um, so yeah, in the in the Islamic neighborhood uh, in France, in the in the suburbs, um, like children are supposed to obey their parents, otherwise they beaten, you know. Uh, but it's not really what caused my trauma. Actually, it's more. Um, so my mother, she one day she she left Islam. So she, she became an apostate. And that leads my father to 
as uh, you said, Jimmy uh, applied the uh, Surat uh, 4 verse uh, 34. So if you're, if, so in Islam, in the Quran, if um, the husband fears the disobedience of his wife, um, so you are allowed to beat her. So this is in the Quran. And also, like, you had the second caliph, so Omar uh, ibn al-Khattab. So he was uh, known to beat his children. So of course, with those two roles models, um, yeah, it seemed as normal to, to treat your family this way. So, so yeah, that, that's really what uh, was the cause of my, my trauma. But of course, it did not make me leave uh, Islam at this moment. I was still a Muslim. I was just thinking, yeah, it was bad uh, behavior from my father. I did not know Islam at the time. Um, so the day I left Islam, of course, I started to to read about uh, all those things. And of course, it it created a, a feeling of bitterness because I, I understood that my father had uh, his conscience for himself. I mean, he just followed what uh, the Quran was telling him to do. Um, and I started to notice also that the apostates were really lonely. So of course, it reminded me of my mother who was lonely at the time, like she had, there was nothing at this time for no organization or anything like that. And um, yeah, that's why I started to create this, uh, this podcast in the beginning. And of course, when I found the opportunity to, to, to be able to start their association, that's when I started to do it. And, and basic, basically, that's my story. So what I wanted to say as a conclusion is uh, no matter what your past uh, was made of, you have the choice to, to use it to change uh, your future. So. Yeah. First time. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the note that Momo said, no matter what your past is, you have the chance to change the future. Yeah. <laughs> so, to but use it. Trans transform, 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 and turn this this on its head. I really like uh, because um, I want to. It's this vibe, this energy. Um, whenever you, we, I come to these things, it almost feels like it's a fuck you to Islam. It's also uh, a personal grabbing agency back. I just wanted to add that. That is important to... to it's off topic, but you know. <laughs> oh, great. You know, I, I was really excited to share this panel with men because it takes so much courage and vulnerability for men to talk about trauma as well. And that's something that, you know, is more prevalent for ex-Muslims. And I'm going to bring it back to the professional here. Um, Jimmy, you've worked with a lot of ex-Muslims from around the globe, um, people in emergency situations, but also people in the West who are relatively safe, you know, even people who've come out like Jamal mentioned, people who've left dangerous environments have come to a safe place. There's still a lot of anxiety, depression, um, but also just a lot of trauma that they carry. What are some of the things that you've noticed that overlaps with a lot of ex-Muslims that they carry on as they grow? Um, okay, so uh, it was quite hard to listen to your question, actually, because I'm still stuck with the verse 434 and your dad being your mum. Uh, so my dad used to also beat my mum, and when I was like, you know, you know, you're not a proper Muslim, you beat your wife, and he was like, no, actually, it says I can beat my wife. So the idea that actually the religion actually l gives legitimate sanction to violence against women is so important that we, we stress that to people. Um, I think, and then also uh, Kamal, is it Kamal? Jamal. 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 Yeah. Jamal. Uh, Jamal, the... the what you were saying was actually sometimes I forget, almost like I forget to be afraid now. We've been doing this for so long yeah. for a number of us. But as you were talking about that, I was like, actually, yeah, I live in a really Muslim area uh, back in London. And there are then moments of like, oh, I wonder if somebody might recognize me or you know, what that might provoke in, a, uh, in the coffee shop I work in when it's like Jummah prayer and all the Muslims are coming in. I'm like, gosh, I wonder if one of these people might recognize me and then tell everybody else and how that might play out. Um, but looping back to your question, so I think it can be really useful to think about the ex-Muslim experience as uh, mirroring or quite synonymous as the gay experience. So we use a lot of the same vernacular, like ex-Muslims will talk about being in the closet 
uh, gay people will also talk about being in the closet. We'll also talk about coming out. Uh, I'm kind of taken back to Ali and Aleem's conversation yesterday where they talked about, you know, kind of this dissolving of the homophobia that they were experiencing by watching, I think, Brokeback Mountain and Philadelphia. You could have just used Grindr or Tinder. <laughs> but whatever. So, uh, so um, the, the experience of being gay is, you know, also a very isolating experience for, for many of us. And the idea of having, uh, you know, a heteronormative upbringing. So you see your mum and your dad and you think, oh, this is what I'm going to grow in, up into and we're going to have, I'll have kids someday and uh, I'm going to mirror what society expects me to do and there's a role for me to grow up into. And then you realize you're a gay, you're a gay guy and actually that isn't true anymore. So similarly for, um, and there may be also these kind of structures of oppression towards you to try and push you into a heteronormative uh, lifestyle. So it's really about identity and then also the oppression that you experience. And that is identical for the ex-Muslim experience. There is this role that's expected of you as a Muslim that you should grow up into and you should emulate and pass on to your children. But that role, as you move into um, understanding that Islam isn't true for you, there is this unraveling of your identity, what society is expecting for you to um, be and what you expected for you to be kind of begins to unravel at a different pace for different people and then the structures of oppression whether it's in you know the more um, difficult areas which are Muslim majority countries where it might be the state oppression or it might just be community oppression and family oppression um, within somewhere like the UK. I, yeah yes please. Uh, I just want to say uh, uh, my father beat my mother too. So we have common thing, I think, many. But, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this was the one of the wake-up call for me when I was young. Uh, my op uh, observation uh, of my mother's life and the other woman's life in my community, they had more, uh, less or more the same uh, oppression from their husbands and family and restri restricted uh, rights. So uh, when we were Muslim, we, we looked this like uh, uh, this is a cultural problem. But when I realized that this is, how, how can be cultural? K Kurdish culture, Turkish culture, Arabic, Somali, uh, African, uh, Iranian culture, uh, they have the same oppression, very similar. So this has to do something with Islamic culture, not the nation culture. Uh, and th this is the one thing, and the other thing uh, I just want, uh, and the other thing I just want to add that uh, about the, uh, um, uh, Ex-Muslims in the West, uh, uh, this shouldn't be like that, you know? My dream was that you can say whatever you want to say about your bullshit religion. Like they do still today, Christian people, uh, dissidents, right? Atheist people, they are here. They do this in the West. And they did in 400 years. Uh, but when we do Islamophobia, racism, now they will call me is Muslim hater because I will say every Muslim need therapy, psychological help. My mother too, <laughs> me too, every because <laughs> it, it, because Muhammad say beat your children if they don't pray. Quran say beat your wife if you fear, if you fear not that you see your wife do something wrong, but if you fear that your wife may be will do something wrong, be it. You know, what kind of childhood, what kind of life? You need therapy, everyone, everyone needs. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Can I, just, I <laughs> can I just add one thing? So I think you raise a really important point, which is actually a lot of the work that I, that I do with people is about boundary setting. Because, you know, we're, we're born into families where obedience is expected. Either you're expected to be obedient to the rules of God, however dissonant or discordant you might find them with yourself. But then also there is this level of, you know, like heaven is underneath your mum's feet. You can't get in unless your mum tells you what to do and you completely um, give in to it. And then obviously this, you know, looming presence over your shoulder of violence at any time that so many of us experience. And what that does is it really doesn't teach you as an adult how to have boundaries. And for many of us, it wouldn't have been safe to have boundaries uh, in our adolescence. It may not be in the families that we exist in, but where it is, a lot of the work that we'll do with clients, I'm sure Mimsy will echo this as well, and Walid, is that you're, you're working with clients to let them know, okay, what would be a healthy boundary here? 
how would you establish that boundary? What does that conversation look like? How does it feel to even begin to think about having those kind of conversations? So, you know, there is this kind of erosion of um, your personal space with Islam, this erosion of your personal identity and reforming that, like learning how to actually step into yourself and your authentic self whilst holding quite a firm ground that enables you to do so in what can be a compassionate way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this, the, the, what, uh, and I'm not a psychologist, uh, Jimmy, maybe no, you mind. can correct me. <laughs> <laughs> a therapist, yeah, but maybe you can correct me on this. It's, it's about the, how it unconscious, even though you're unlearning, uh, and you're on your own journey, you're doing therapy and all of those things, it, it somehow, because the, f the, the foundation of boundaries and, and, and how to be autonomous in yourself as a child wasn't raised with you, I'm 43 years to old today and I'm still unlearning stuff even though I feel balanced. I still feel like there's something in my subconscious that kind of takes me to some I don't know, non-autonomy, non non-agency, like I need to ask for permission uh, by being polite or something like that. So uh, yeah, maybe that's, that's um, an important thing to, to always keep in mind that even consciously when we have unlearned and, and, and walked away, it does take many, 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 many years to consciously continue to unlearn, yeah. Um, yes, Milad, please. Yeah. Um, talking about um, children and um, trauma, um, I'm hoping for the world that people like Jimmy uh, could get a job in country like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, <laughs> and stuff. Would be brilliant. But um, like talking about the trauma, like the children's issues and Islamic child abuse, I would say it's something we have to like you know realize and work against it. I think in Sweden, for example, uh, there's a poster by the migration board saying like, for you who've been married with an underage, and that specifically uh, was published for those Muslim men who married with underage uh, girls. And you know, like you know, having sex with someone underage is like big crime in Sweden. However, if you're coming from a Muslim background, they can let you do that. And the migration board published a poster for you. Like, I know in Germany, for example, Mina Hadi, which is in Saloon now, they're collecting signature to ban hijab for children in, at schools. And we're doing the same thing at the Central Committee of Scandinavia in Sweden. So if we can um, like, you know, protect the children from the abuse of religion, uh, that would be like a you know, big step. Uh, to stop the trauma by, um, by, by, the, by, by the religion and by the Islam. And people like Jimmy would be jobless, I know that. Yeah, so there would be <laughs> no one go to him for trauma, but that would be the, one of the most important steps to protect children from religion, I would say. I mean, I think that is the goal, right? The goal is to, to, to make all of us redundant. Uh, actually, I do, we don't want to be uh, activists pushing against religious theocracy. We want to be in a position where actually sitting across the table from your dad, who is a Muslim, uh, him knowing that you're an ex-Muslim, the only conversation that happens is, pass me the chapatis. You know, that's, <laughs> as, that's as benign as we want it to be, right? <laughs> Um, I just wanted to give Mo the final word Thank before you. we open it up to questions. Yep. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, the traumatic experience, now I'm done with it, I mean, but the good thing with it, if I, there is a good thing, is now I'm really focused on, uh, on what happened to me so I can really uh, an analyze uh, the, my story and after that be able to, to see if... Um, what my father did was right or wrong, I have a clear vision, you know. So I cannot get fooled by uh, people telling me this is not true, this is not in Islam, whatever. I, I really know what happened to me. I really know why my father did it. So now I'm really using it to, to be more uh, performative in a way, you know, because I, um, I, I know I have some goals and this is fueling me. I mean, uh, sometimes it's a bit sad for people who had a very nice childhood, nothing happened. How can you get the energy to, to go into activism at this? <laughs> see? I mean, I try to make it in a positive way. Really, 
Of course, some people here, uh, to, uh, we, we heard they had really hard stories. I don't know, maybe at this point it's really broken. But for me, it makes me realize that um, uh, really it's, it's giving me some energy, a bit like the Chinese, the yin and the yang. I mean, finally, the bad things that happened to me can give me some uh, positive energy to, to really do what I believe, I mean, and change uh, really the future. <laughs> Um, one of the reasons I was really passionate and even told Mariam that I really want to chair this panel is because, you know, working with Faithless Ajabi has really enabled me to understand that there is so much academia lacking or research lacking when it comes to religious trauma when it comes uh, with ex-Muslims. It's very different. A lot of the research that we see in... Whoops. Uh, religious trauma has to do with an ex-Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. But when there is an apostasy death penalty on your head, where even in the West or even in France where there's laicite, mm -hmm. you face what you did. And in Iran, it's a complete different landscape. There is very little academia that supports how we work with ex-Muslims as well. So please, of course, donate. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think, like, this is kind of an eye-opener for all of us, you know, all these stories that we've grown up with. And now I'd like to open up the floor to not just questions, but I know this panel was on trauma, so I'm pretty sure you'll have something to add of your own. <laughs> Try keeping it brief. I, the, the panel will answer if there's anything, but we'll go through the audiences first. Morten, you feel free to pick as you go up. And, and Khadija behind you. Thank you. Uh, this question is particularly aimed at Jamal because I was quite uh, curious. You didn't really talk about your life as an Islamist and your time in Muslim yeah. Brotherhood. Yeah. So, um, and that's quite a journey that you well, made. So I'd be quite interested to hear more about what, what you did as a, a part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Thank you. Uh, we'll answer the questions right after. So if, we, if you remember your answer. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, um, all your experiences, and uh, I'm sure many of us can relate uh, to these experiences. I want to s um, ask about uh, what you mentioned, Milad, about um, child abuse uh, that is done in the name of religion, and that has been normalized in the Western countries. Uh, I see that whenever there is uh, a question of protecting children from abuse, uh, everybody is very much, uh, you know, efficient in their response. Everybody want to, uh, you know, wants to res uh, protect children from abuse, but when it comes to the minority background children, uh, they just turn a blind eye. Uh, French uh, authorities, they have banned uh, hijab in the schools, and uh, I, uh, for the children, I very much support this thing, but the discussion about banning hijab for children in schools in the UK has been, uh, you know, brushed under the carpet, and I really feel frustrated about it because we are not even discussing this issue, uh, let alone, you know, just protecting those children from uh, the abuse that is done in the name of religion. So how can we just tear up this discussion? I mean, uh, I have tried my best, but literally nobody is willing to take up this, you know, discussion. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of ask a question, but kind of a statement as well. Um, what do you th what do you think is the um, therapeutic benefit of a conference like this? Um, because it is so important to feel uh, solidarity and a part of a, a a crew that has your back, um, and it's definitely helped me, and it's it, it's. This is the first time I've come to a conference like this. It's actually the first time I've met any, well, second time I've met any ex-Muslims as well in real life because all, all of the, the, the um, communications I've had and work I've done has all been online. And so this is really refreshing. So, you know, things like this are so important and it would just be good to hear like any group therapy, sort of like benefits that people have had and things like that as well. Thank you. Hi. Um, hi, this is Haram Doodles. So something I noticed um, about two years ago when I started my page, I think a lot of ex-Muslims just wanted someone to listen to them. And I've gotten, 
I've lost count, like thousands and thousands of messages over the last two years. Um, and something I've been thinking about is, should we, as just regular people, is there some level of like peer support or, um, or something that we can do if we're not, you know, like I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not a psychologist, mm -hmm. but I have thought about getting a peer support certification or something that might be helpful for other ex-Muslims. Um, I can listen, but I, I can't advise them on anything. And I don't feel like it's my place. And so yeah. is there anything that you would, you know, what kind of guidance would you give us just normal people that, you know, want to help, but maybe a little more discreetly? Uh, but, but in shortly, uh, I was not a terrorist. I was an Islamist. And this means is I want, I want to implement, uh, imp implement the Islamic law in Turkish state. I was a leader uh, for Yacht uh, branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey. The name is Milli Görüş. It is like uh, the same one as Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, just a Turkish one. Uh, so uh, I made a magazine and a demonstration like I do now for ex-Muslims. I was for the Muslims one. <laughs> Yes, and luckily I'm not there. And the number two, uh, three, third question there, from there, I just want to ask, uh, answer a little bit about, she asked uh, how like these uh, events can help uh, to ex-Muslims, uh, traumatized ex-Muslims and things. Uh, this is the solution. You know, I support every ex-Muslims. Also, uh, I know that I disagree with a lot of them, politically and other things can be very disagree. But I support all the time because of this is the solution. To stand out as an ex-Muslim. If everyone do this, it will be normal to left Islam. It, be, it will be uh, less traumatized uh, and less problems. And so I call myself ex-Muslim. And still today, in the West, many Westerners think why they call themselves ex-Muslims. Uh, they, uh, they, they are finished from Islam. Why I do that? Like say, I'm ex-husband of bullshit. <laughs> because to be an ex-Muslim is a problem. People are dying every day. Just go and uh, uh, search the um, persecution tracker by uh, uh, ex-Muslims of America, for example. Or just go and check every country. Who died last month? Who, who get prisoned last month because of blasphemy, because of apostasy. This is a huge problem, and, and everybody has to understand, and this is the only solution. If I do, you do, everybody do, and we publish, and because many young people sending mail to me, and I'm sure to you too, that they are ex-Muslims, but they cannot uh, be in, in the public. But they will come. Like Ibn Warak, he is here, and he writes the book 20 years ago. Right? And this helped with many people. Like in this time, Alicina, later, Mariam Namasi, and later we come. They opened the v v way for us. So like this event is very important, and I hope everybody will support all, this, all, all the time. OK, I wanted to answer to Haram Duda, who told us, what can you do if you're not, uh, you don't think you have a specific uh, job or profession like psychotherapist. So as a president, I face, of course, this issue. So some people, they come, sometimes they tell me, I'm just motivated. But it's okay, it's enough. Because me, I have every Wednesday uh, a meeting. So I tell them, just come to the meeting. We will talk about our issues. And of course, you will find something to do at this point. So I will give you a random example that come that popped to my mind. Uh, like we have this North African guy, he wants to go to Europe because he's persecuted in his country. So this guy who had no specific uh, talent, we will call it like that, uh, he, he's the one who's filling all the, the forms, all the administrative stuff, which are totally annoying, you know? And uh, yeah, but he, he's motivated, so he, he's using this time like that. And, and after that, he told me, yeah, but I don't have so much time because it's super long, it's super complex. So I told him, okay, I will, I will, I will, go for a call and I will ask you for help. And I got maybe five or six people now, they're all helping this uh, North African man and soon he will be able to come to France. So that's really what you should do. If you're motivated, just go to your local, I mean, 
the country uh, organization of apostate, go, go to them, tell them I'm just motivated, make me do something. If they, the president of this country, is, uh, of the apostate country, is not able to, to, to tell you what to do, it means the president is, uh, is failing in a way. I mean, you go, you go uh, example, you go to, to Great Britain, you ask Mariam Namazi, I, I want to help. Of course she will tell you, this is the thing you can do, this is the thing you can do. Same in France, of, I guess same in any country. And if there is nothing in your country, build your own uh, association. I mean, it's basic. So, yeah, um, yeah the, um, I think Sweden has the same situation like uh, UK regarding the child's issue. Um, what we can do is um, we have to start acting, not just like you know, talking about it. Because it's obvious, like, you know, it's a double standard when it comes to religions issue and children uh, by the like you know, children who comes from uh, like you know migrants family. Uh, my point is, as I, as I mentioned, in Germany, for example, the Central Committee, the Council of Ex-Muslim in um, in Germany, they're collecting signatures to ban hijab at the schools. If you live in Germany, sign the petition today. If you live in Sweden, just check our website. There's like a different uh, petitions going on at the moment. If you sign these petitions and be part of the movement, then if we can collect, for example, 1,000 or 10,000, 100,000 of signatures to support uh, children's right against religion abuses, then we can do something. Then it can be in the parliament. I'm happy to say that. The discourses in Sweden, for example, has changed. And there's a big appetite to listen uh, to, to the voice of ex-Muslim, like you know, uh, free thinkers and secular immigrants, but we have to start acting. One of the one of the things, one of the features of ex-Muslims, which I really appreciate and I really like, is not just a coffee shop. It's not just not a gathering uh, place that people just sit and talk about their experiences. Ex-Muslim act something and change the world in practice. So if you really want to do something, my recommendation would be join the ex-Muslim, sign the petition, and do something, and we can change the society in Europe, I think. Uh, Magnus and Jana, he's talking about you when it comes to humanists in uh, Sweden. Just letting you guys know. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, but also there has to be space for regular ex-Muslims who might not be political activists, right? We have to create this, this idea that there's a whole activist class of us, but there's sometimes just regular people who want to share their experience because they're going through something that is, you know, fundamentally isolating for them, this unraveling of your identity whilst also experiencing this overarching oppression. And I think in answer to your question, the antidote to those two things which are isolating really is community and actually community probably is peer support more than it is sitting down with a therapist right that's your one hour a week but what you need is something more um, sustained than that and I think there's a lot that's out there so uh, Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain we run a support group that people come into online so it doesn't matter where you are in the country over the pandemic we had people from all over Europe joining this uh, support group. It's run by a clinical psychologist. Um, but there's people, I think, with Discord groups out there yep. who have got, uh, yeah, who have got like, you know, community in that mechanism. Um, there's other ex Muslim groups I know who do Zoom calls with each other just so that they can uh, have that kind of connection. I think, yeah, I think the answer really is community, 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 community. Uh, making sure that people have got relationships with each other to have that shared experience. If you have a psychotherapist, fantastic, that's great. If you don't, you know, by no means is it a requirement to um, reducing your isolation. Of course. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can I say uh, one more thing? I'll be so quick. Like, <laughs> in, in that community, I think it's especially, especially important, and, and I'm saying this because there's a few people who are missing this year at the conference who I would have liked to have seen here. So in this spirit of community and underneath the banner of celebrating dissent, I think that as we build the community, our ability to sit with difference, like difference opinions, uh, contradiction, our ability to sit with what might feel antagonistic. You know, I'm thinking uh, really about 
uh, the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict and how that's fragmented some kind of relationships either perceived or actually within the ex-Muslim uh, community. You know, our ability to sit with something as hard as this ideology I was brought up in, which tells me what ultimate truth is, both before and after death. If we are able to navigate that, we should really be able to sit with different opinions around any political spectrum that's going on in the world at the time. Um, just if, uh, I, if I can just make a few points. Actually, everybody was invited to the conference yeah, yeah, from yeah. different political yeah. spectrums. And if they didn't come, it's for various reasons. Uh, but definitely everyone is welcome, irrespective of differences of opinion, as we can see here in the hall today as well. I just wanted to make a few points uh, that were raised. I think hugely important issues were raised. I think creating an international peer support network yeah. is really something we haven't yet done. And that is something we need to organize very quickly. I think the other issue is, of course, the issue of funding. Uh, I mean, Nada yesterday from Croatia, I don't know if she's here, but she made a list of all the money that's going to the Christian nationalists, uh, the white supremacists from the US, for example, to Europe, millions and millions of dollars in order to support far-right fascist movements. There is not, not that corresponding support for those of us who are fighting for human rights, really, for fundamental rights, and for those who are free thinkers and critics of religion. I am sure we have millionaires who are not fascists. There must be. <laughs> are there? And if they are, I mean, this is a call, really, uh, to, to ask for real support, financial support. I think also lacking is support from the larger free thought, humanist, secularist movements that see us as a side issue and do not recognize the fact that we are on the front lines of fighting religious fundamentalism across the globe because the rise of Islamism has seen a corresponding rise of other far-right religious right movements. And so supporting ex-Muslims, I think, is hugely important and not having us as tokens at their events in their planning in their strategy but as part and parcel of this movement for atheism for free thought for free expression given the importance of the work that we're doing thank you and thank you to all of you um. <laughs> to, to add one point yes there's a vast money flowing into the, uh, flowing into the Christian right and from the Christian right to other fascist movements, but that, um, as far as I know, that mapping has not been done for Islamist movements. And many of you know them from the inside or have known from that they have think tanks, they have, uh, it's done for Hindutva, activists working on Hindutva has worked on it, but I don't know of a document that maps it for Islamist movements, and I think that is a project that we could take up. Uh, only in Norway, I think, uh, 300, almost 300 Islamist organizations f founded uh, under the religious group. In this little Norway, 5 million people living, 300 organization, name it, cultural, Islamic cultural, Islamic cultural centers. It's crazy. Perfect, thank you so much. I know a lot of people had more to contribute to the panel. Um, but your panelists will meet you at the break, so please hog them and <laughs> ask some questions. <laughs>